Hello everyone, welcome to Due Process. This is Trevor Wadden. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Ian Frazier, Professor of Psychology at St. Thomas University. Ian and I will be discussing memory fallibility and eyewitness testimony and whether this information is common knowledge in society and the justice system. By way of further background, Ian has conducted research in perceptual psychology, psychology and the law, health and psychology, positive psychology and personality psychology. He is renowned for his style of teaching and has won numerous awards in recognition of his effective approach. He has authored and co-authored numerous papers and articles that appeared in several publications, including Criminal Law Quarterly. Ian and his collaborators have done extensive research on our chosen topic of memory fallibility and the need to better equip our courts and justice players with the means to better understand these issues in the court of law. Ian, it is great to have you, so thank you very much for coming on today. Oh, you're welcome. So Ian, I just provided a brief summary of your, your background, but I want to start with a few questions on perceptual psychology, which is one of your main areas of focus. Can you give us an idea of what perceptual psychology is and how it differs from traditional psychology? Well, it is one of the subfields of psychology. And basically what you do is you study how people perceive the world, how they take the information out in the real world, bring it into the visual system or auditory system, the sensory systems, bring it up, analyze it, and map it to memory. And obviously memory would fall into this study? Memory actually is more on the cognitive side of things, right? Because what happens in perception is basically most of what you're doing, you're not aware you're doing because you become aware of something when you recognize what it is you're looking at. Then, of course, you go into the cognitive components of memory and decision making. Got you. So how did you get involved with studying human senses and perceptions generally? And is that something that had always interested you or something you discovered later in your academic career? That I've always been into when I did my honors thesis. It was on the sound localization in rats and the development of sound localization in rats. And then I went off to Aberdeen University and there I got into face perception and how we perceive faces, and more specifically in an area that is called feature saliency, which sort of edges into and would be of interest to lawyers, because there are certain features of the face we attend to and we analyze more effectively than others. For example, hairline and eyes are more salient than the nose and the mouth. So if you were, for example, to take a look at police sketch artists rendition of a suspect. They're, of course, receiving this information from the witness, and they are attempting to draw based on what the witness has said. You will notice a lot of times in these sketches that there's far more detail in the upper region of the face, far more detail with the hair and eyes, and then the nose and the mouth oftentimes not very much detail at all. Well, that's because the police sketch artists cannot predict what the nose and mouth look like. They have to depend on the witness, and the witness has concentrated more on the hair and eye region. And we wanted to know why that was the case. And just out of curiosity, did what was the, uh, the conclusion on that? Well, no, nobody has found out why yet. Uh, one of the things that we found in the studies that we did that we more readily and more efficiently pick up the eyes and the hair. And since oftentimes we're more efficient at it, that's where we're going to focus our attention. That's interesting. I'm talking with some other people about whether we should be assessing nonverbal cues in courts or police should be using those those factors. And there seems to be a consensus that we have to be very, very careful with using them. But some are arguing that to try to eliminate them completely is, well, unrealistic, but also would be detrimental, particularly in a court of law where we rely so much on seeing expression and empathy and emotion in someone's face. Well, let's, let's put it this way. You can tell a jury to ignore it, but you're not going to get them to ignore it. You're going to have to deal with it. You can't simply say we have to get rid of it because you can't get rid of it. It's almost like telling them not to do something just increases their attention on that area, which is a, an interesting topic and something we are discussing with, with other guests. But I want to get back to, to you, Ian, and, and how you came to be involved then in, in the study of memory or writing for lawyers and police officers and players in the justice system with respect to memory fallibility? Yeah, well, that happened merely by chance. In 2008, I was sitting in my office and I got a call from a lawyer from St. John called Barry Morrison. 
And he called me out of the blue because he wanted to, he was writing an article and he wanted some feedback on this article. And he understood I was in the area of perception. And so I was on the edge. I knew about memory and that sort of thing. And this is what he was writing about. He said, would I take a look at it for him? So I said, I have no problem with that. So he sent me the article. Well, one of the things that I noticed right off was I would never have written it the way he wrote it. Not that what he wrote was bad in any way, shape or form, right? It's just different from the way I would have written it. But also one of the things I noticed was he was talking about memory and the fallibility of memory, but he was leaving key players out like Gary Wells, Elizabeth Loftus, Daniel Yarmy, Roderick Lindsay. These are big players, Canadian and American, and, and they weren't being mentioned. So what I did was wrote in the margins and suggested a couple of changes and referred him to people like uh, Gary Wells and Elizabeth Loftus. And sent it back to him. Well, it was covered in red ink, so I wasn't expecting that I'd get any response from him. But uh, two weeks later, he calls me up and he says, no, I like what you've, you've suggested. He said, why don't you come on board and write it with me? And I paused. I said, well, let me think about it. Because what he was talking about in this paper was something that we as psychologists had known for over 30 years. And to be a psychologist and go on this paper talking about stuff that's 30 years old would be problematic. So I, I said, leave it with me and let me think about it. So I started doing a little background research and I began to realize that I wasn't wrong. Psychologists have been talking about this stuff for years, but I also noticed they were actually writing this and placing it in psych journals and not in law journals. So you're never going to get a lawyer necessarily to come to a psych journal, just like you're not going to get a psychologist to read a law journal. So what you needed to do was actually take this stuff and put it into law journals. And this is what Barry was doing. So I looked a little further and I came across, of course, a little quotation from Gary Wells. Gary Wells was part of the team put together by Janet Reno the then justice minister in the U.S. And basically, because of the advent of DNA evidence, there were a lot of exonerations taking place. And a lot of these guilty verdicts were based on faulty eyewitness testimony. About 70% of the exoneration cases were cases that involved faulty eyewitness testimony. Well, of course, Janet Reno wanted to take a look at this. So she put a commission together of prosecutors and defense lawyers, of police officers, and brought psychologists in. And Gary Wells was one of those psychologists. And he said that he was honored to be asked to be on this commission, but was rather flabbergasted because we have been telling lawyers for 30 years that eyewitness testimony is fallible. It should not have taken DNA evidence for them to listen, right? So basically, uh, I realized that the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. And what Barry Morrison was doing was he had an interest in this and he was writing it for lawyers. So that's when I got involved. And you mentioned earlier that psychologists had known about this for more than 30 years and to put yourself on a paper like this would have been problematic. Is that just because as a researcher, you're supposed to be trying to develop and move science forward? Well, to us or to me, it was, yes, I've got my research going on, right, in the feature saliency component, right, to step back and rehash old stuff isn't really going to be effective, but then realizing that it's not rehashing it because for a lot of these lawyers, it's the first time they're ever going to see it because it's actually now going into a law journal. One of the things that I had to do was relearn to write because I write in what's known as the American Psychological Association APA format, right? Which is not Canadian legal citation, which is a whole different format, which of course a lot of Canadian law journals use. The way lawyers write is different than the way a psychologist would write. So I had to relearn to write and write for lawyers, not write as a psychologist for lawyers, but write for lawyers in a language that they'll understand and they're familiar with. 
So was Barry's goal then initially to, to try to get this information that psychologists had known for a long time disseminated within the legal community? Exactly. So I borrowed a quote from one of your articles about how this isn't a new area. It's been known for a, for a long time. And I, I thought this quote helped to illustrate that quote, the mere fact of being human being results in distorted memory and accurate testimony, end quote. And despite all of the, the information that is known about human memory and some of the fallibility that's associated with it, it is, and I'm speaking from my experiences now, when I was a lawyer and in the justice system, going through law school even, there isn't a lot of discussion about it, from my experience anyway. So I'm going to ask the general question here, what do we know about human memory? Is it as accurate as some of us like to think? For instance, is it like pressing play on a recorder or a movie, or is it more fluid? It is much more fluid. In fact, Elizabeth Loftus talked about it being like looking through a milky gauze or something to that effect. It's, it's not photographic. It's not stamped in. It can be impacted and manipulated. A prime example, of course, because Elizabeth Loftus has been this, at this for a long time, she did a simple study back in the 70s and it's one that's in all the psych textbooks. Every psych textbook has this as an example. Basically, what she did was she showed a film of two cars in an accident. And basically, the participants watched this happen. Then the participants were given a series of questions. And one of the questions that they got was about how fast were the cars going when they, and the only thing that was changed was the verb. And if I remember rightly, it was smashed, crashed, bumped, collided, right, was the verbs used. One of the things they found, which was really interesting, was the rate of speed changed depending on the verb used. So one change in one verb can change your memory for an event. Yeah, so that's pretty unsettling when you think about the consequences of that. Exactly. And... They did a further study where they actually brought the people back and asked them, did you see glass at the accident scene? And what they found was those people who had indicated a higher rate of speed said, yes, there was glass at the accident scene. There wasn't, but already their memory had changed. And then their schema for the memory suggests that if they were going at that high rate of speed, there must have been glass. So just by changing the one word, you can get dramatic differences in, in recollection. And traditionally, eyewitness testimony is considered, I think it's fair to say anyway, very persuasive. Why do you think that is? Why do you think people believe someone that's very confident in their recollection telling a story? Why is it so appealing for, for most of us to want to believe that person? Let's look at an example. Judge Judy always says, this person is not going to lie because they want the right person found guilty. But the person, the witness is not necessarily lying because they truly believe it happened the way it did. And the problem is we put too much onus on eyewitness testimony. I'll give you an example. Have you ever heard of Timothy Cole? I don't believe so. Okay. Basically what happened with Timothy Cole was an army veteran he was taking a business course at Texas Tech University. There was, in fact, a series of uh, sexual assaults taking place in and around the university at that time. A woman was sexually assaulted. She gave a description. One of the police officers sort of felt it sounded like Timothy Cole, the description. They got a picture of Timothy Cole and put it into a photo lineup of five other pictures. Timothy Cole's was the only one in color, right? Uh, he was selected by her. What then happened was there was a live lineup. She selected him again. Problem is, once you've got a lineup, right, where you pick somebody, then, of course, you're going to look. It's familiarity, and you're going to see that person again. Anyways, she gave her testimony, and she chose Timothy Cole, even though Timothy Cole had an alibi, his brother and his friends were playing cards with him at the time. She mentioned that the black person who had assaulted her was uh, a chain smoker. Timothy Cole had severe asthma and couldn't go near cigarettes. 
It was also noted that the rapes continued after he was incarcerated. But you see, none of those things impacted the fact that she had chosen him and he was incarcerated. He died in prison from a severe asthmatic attack. He was later posthumously exonerated because another person admitted to the crime who was already serving time in prison. But the big thing here is how important her eyewitness testimony was. With all of the other evidence there, it didn't seem to impact it. So it just goes to show you the, the powerful or the impact that this testimony can have. I'm going to refer to it tongue in cheek here, but the judge Judy factor where why would this person want, have any reason to lie? Like she, she doesn't have any reason to lie. She wants to get the right person. Obviously there's more to it. And we'll get into discussing photo lineups in particular here in a, in a few minutes. We'll turn now to discussing some of the different variables and factors that can influence uh, or affect our memory. And to help us do that, we'll, we'll discuss Gary Wells, who is a renowned psychologist and study of memory. And he came up with the terms system and estimator variables in terms of discussing memory and the impact that these can have on memory. So we'll begin with estimator variables. What are these and how may they impact our memory? Okay, estimator variables. Why they're called estimator variables is these variables often occur during the actual crime being committed. So therefore, they're out of the influence of the system, the police officers, lawyers, etc., right? Because they're happening at the time of the crime. So all you can do is estimate their effect on a person's eyewitness veracity, right? So give you some examples. Oftentimes you'll find, especially when it comes to sexual assault cases, there is a, a problem in that there is a thing called cross-racial bias. Oftentimes some of the rape cases that have taken place are when a black African-American attacks a white female. If you look at cases like, which we will talk about, I, I think a little later on, the Williams case, but we also, if you look at Ronald Cotton, there are many, many cases where you've got a white woman identifying a black assailant. And one of the things that is noted is that we are better at detecting people of our own race than people of other races. And this is a known fact. And in fact, the Innocence Project has indicated that when it comes to things like sexual assault, one of the big factors for erroneous convictions is, in fact, cross-racial bias. And that has to be taken into consideration. You can't influence it. You can't change it. But you've got to take it into consideration. The distance the witness is away from the act, whether it happens at night, whether it's raining, whether there is objects in the way, whether the person is an elderly witness who may not have the best eyesight or the best hearing, or often, in a lot of cases, children as eyewitnesses. You have to take all of that into consideration. How accurate is their recollection going to be? And all you have to do is estimate the impact that these variables have. So when, you, when we say we're estimating the impact that these variables would have, do psychologists have like a formula or like a, a scale that they would look at? No, no. You just simply have to estimate. You have to be aware that these things can impact. In the case of Timothy Cole, it was a white woman and Timothy Cole was African-American. And you mentioned a list of them. And, and I want to talk about De the Derek Williams case from one of the examples you use in, in one of your articles. But I also want to talk about what is referred to as weapon focus. Can you just describe what that is? Bingo. That's another one. If there is a weapon involved, oftentimes what will happen is the person will focus, the witness will focus on the weapon, especially if they happen to be the one being assailed. They've got this gun sticking in their face. They're going to be concentrating on that gun. And if they concentrate on that gun, that means they're not going to be very good at identifying the person. Typically, what you want to do if you're going to actually hold up is fire the gun off over here. They're staring at the gun. They're not staring at your face. If you do this, right, then you're lining up your face with the gun. Right? And if you remember the old uh, bank robberies. Basically, what they would do is they'd come in and they'd shoot 
the gun into the ceiling and say everybody on the floor. Well, everyone sound wise, visually wise is focusing on that gun and then dropping to the floor. They're not seeing the fact. You know that they're going to be concentrating on the weapon. And that means that when they go to identify a person, you've got to take that into consideration because they're most likely focusing on the gun. Okay, so let's talk about the the case of Derek Williams, because I think this included some estimator variables. It did. Both estimator and system, and we'll talk about system later, we'll do the estimator variables. In the Derek Williams case, yes, you have this white woman driving into her driveway. When she's in her driveway, she sees a African-American man on her porch. She gets out of the car. He comes up behind her, right, puts her in a chokehold, takes his shirt off, wraps it around her face, throws her in the back of the car, drives her to an orange grove and assaults her, sexually assaults her. As he's getting out, so he's going to put her in the trunk of the car, she manages to escape. He takes off, runs through a person's backyard. Now, the interesting thing here is she's coming home about five o'clock in the evening. It's raining. He, whoever the assailant is, is on the porch about 20 feet away. So she's looking through the windshield of her car in the rain at five o'clock at a person 20 yards away. He is black. She is white. So there's a whole bunch of estimated variables there. The distance she is the way, the fact that it's raining and it's obscuring a clear vision of the person, the fact that the person is African-American and standing on the porch, all of these things are going to impact her ability to accurately describe her assailant. Okay. And in that case, her testimony was very persuasive and Mr. Williams was ultimately convicted and he served 18 years in prison before being exonerated. And he was exonerated by DNA evidence because, of course, the shirt, the assailant wrapped around her, was still with the car, and they could do the DNA evidence to find out that it wasn't Derek. And we can continue to talk about Derek Williams' case here as we move to discuss now the system variables that can impact someone's memory. Can you just give us a description of what those are and how they differ from estimator ones? System variables are variables that can be controlled by the system. That means it can be controlled by the justice system. And it depends on things like how questions are asked, how lineups are conducted, how interrogations are performed. All of these things are system variables that can influence or distort a person's memory for an event. And of course, let's face it, we want an accurate recollection as accurate as we possibly can because we want the right person incarcerated for the crime they committed. And those system variables are key elements. For example, the study that was done by Elizabeth Loftus and John Palmer show how a system variable, the simple interview and how the interview is conducted can influence a person's memory for an event. Now, luckily, psychologists have come up with the best way to interview a person. And the best way to interview a person is what's called the cognitive interview technique. And basically with a cognitive interview technique, the police officer asks an open-ended question. Please tell me in your own words what happened and let the person complete their narrative. Don't interrupt. Let them complete it. Then you might ask them, could you tell me again from this particular point? and let them run through it. And what happens is studies have shown that you can use the cognitive interview technique and compare it to a regular police interview. And you do far better with a cognitive interview technique and getting accurate recollections. Now, there was a study done by Allison back in, I think it was the late 80s. And she got a hold of, by permission, videos of Canadian police officers interviewing a person. Then she had a bunch of raiders rate what they saw. And how the police officers began? Open-ended question. Great. Within 30 seconds, interrupted the witness. Began to ask closed-ended questions, like, was he wearing a hat? Which gives you a monosyllabic answer, yes, no. 
And what they're doing now is they're interrupting the narrative flow. Sometimes they even ask leading questions. Was the hat he was wearing blue? He may not have been wearing a hat, but the fact that you've now said, right, was the hat he wearing blue, you've now got the witness thinking they must have been wearing a hat. So what you're doing is you're influencing the situation. And it's very scary because, of course, a police officer isn't wanting to do this. A police officer is trying to get as accurate a recollection as possible. But the police officer doesn't know that they have this influence. That's one of the big problems. I'm not sure that the circumstance of the Allison study, but one difficulty, obviously, like you said, police officers are trying to get information and they're trying to solve crimes. I'm not sure if the, so if the Allison study was just looking at the interrogation room, because one particular issue is that police officers are often, when they're on the street working patrol, whatever the case may be, things are happening very quickly. And if you're talking to a witness, for example, and there's a potentially violent suspect that's on the lam and you're looking for them, sometimes you have to ask very direct questions and you're suggesting things to them. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you see, that's the problem. Yes, there is this person on the loose. You're right. It is a time constraint. You're right. But if you influence the person that you go off in the wrong direction... It's in the best interest of everybody to to have accurate information. That's right. So you go off in the right direction. Let's face it. If you think about it, in any of these exoneration cases that took place, any of them, the culprit was still on the street to reoffend. The wrong person was in prison. And that's not what you want. No, it was cer- certainly not. That's problematic. So let's let's go back to Derek Williams. What were the 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 system variables that were present in his case? Derek Williams. One of the system variables that stood out was that they did a photo lineup. And his photo was in the lineup twice. I mean, that's like saying, hey, pick me, here I am, right? In fact, if if you look at uh, the Thomas Safnow case, of course, there was all sorts of system variables. It, the lineup was a problem. There were a number of things there. In fact, in the Thomas Safnow case, he was put in a photo lineup and his was the only picture that was taken outside with a Polaroid camera. And when they asked, when Justice Corey, who was doing the uh, commission later, asked Elizabeth Loftus to look at this, Elizabeth Loftus said, this is like saying, pick me, here I am. And of course, in the Derek Williams case, he's twice in the photo lineup. Now, another system variable there, which is kind of interesting, is that the victim actually said that the assailant had a scar on their abdomen. And she actually said she never saw the back of the person because don't forget, she's got this thing over her head. So obviously all she's being able to see is the body directly in front and there was a scar on the abdomen. Somehow later on, and it doesn't indicate how this happened, she found out that Williams had a scar in his back and suddenly the scar changed from the front to the back. Now, how she found this out, nobody knows necessarily, but that's a system problem because somehow she found out and she wasn't supposed to be given this information because this information influenced her memory for the event. Now, other system variables that can happen are are big ones are, of course, the lineup technique and how the lineup technique is conducted. Psychologists have looked into this. And in fact, it was Gary Wells and Roderick Lindsay who came up with what was known as the sequential lineup technique. Typically, lineups were done as simultaneous lineups. You take your six or seven people, you place them in a lineup. The witness is on the other side of a one-way mirror. You turn on the lights. They see everybody in front of them. Then you simply ask them what they'd like, and they would say, please, could number two step forward? Can number two turn to left, turn to the right, step back? And they could ask any of them to be pulled forward so they could get a better look at them and then decide whether or not the suspect is in that lineup. There is a problem with that type of lineup. And the problem is what the person is using is what's known as a relative judgment strategy. What they're doing is comparing and contrasting everybody in the lineup to their memory for the culprit. But if the culprit's not in the lineup, they may choose the next person, right, who most matches their memory. 
Because think about it. The police officer isn't going to pull you in to do a lineup unless they think the person is in the lineup. And if you dismiss the lineup, are you letting the suspect go? The sequential lineup is different. The sequential lineup uses an absolute judgment strategy. And what happens is the first, the first person in the lineup comes in. You have to look at them as a witness and make a decision there whether it is or isn't the suspect. The next suspect then comes in. You can't go back and you have to make your judgment. Well, what happens in that sort of case, if the suspect is not in the lineup, they'll more likely reject the lineup. So presenting them one at a time, basically. That's right. Yeah, and making them making the victim or the witness say yes, that's it, or no, it's not the person. That's right. Would, would that be the same with photo packs then, Ian? Yes, basically it is. In fact, if you look at the uh, Corey recommendations, one of the things that Justice Corey did as a result of the Thomas Safno situation is he said that photo lineups should be done sequentially. I think a lot of police departments have incorporated some of those uh, strategies in, in terms of having an officer that isn't involved in the case and presenting the, the photos one at a time to the, the witness or the victim. Yeah, so it, that's good. It's starting to seep in and hopefully there'll be less um, erroneous convictions based on faulty lineup procedures. Are there any other major system variables? We talked about obviously the interviewing and the, the photo lineups or the mugshot review is another one that... The interrogation technique, of course. The old interrogation technique was allowed for psychological manipulation. You could coerce a person into a confession because as far as the investigator is concerned, they have their person, now they simply need a confession. Now, what happens is that system can work if the investigator has done all of the appropriate background work and knows that they have their person. What happens oftentimes is this technique was used before they got to that point. And when it really fell apart is when they used it before they actually had done a full investigation because they thought they knew they had their person and all they had to do was get them to confess to it. And we have talked to some people about the Reed style of interrogations, which which has been highly criticized, I think it's fair to say, because they use not only some persuasive techniques that have come under the microscope, but there's also a behavioral analysis component of it, which some people find problematic. Bingo. The, the first thing you do is the behavioral analysis to try and figure out what the person is lying to you. And you've already talked about body language. And basically, uh, you're, you're going to be talking to people and they're going to tell you that uh, meta-analyses have been done that show that the police officer is no better than the person off the street in being able to detect deception. Yeah, so far in my conversations with different forensic psychologists, that's the, the consensus is we have to be very, very careful with those nonverbal cues. So just going back to memory here, Ian, is this, not to oversimplify, but is it fair to say that the human mind is very, or memory is very susceptible to suggestion? Very susceptible. There is a study that Elizabeth Loftus did. Oftentimes, it's the easiest title they gave it is the Lost in the Mall Studies. And basically what they do is they go to a relative or relatives and ask them to give their recollections of things that have happened in the participants past, right? And these things are written down. These topics are written down. What happens is the investigator then removes one and randomly sticks in an artificial one, one that never happened to this person just randomly placed in. Then what happens is the participant looks at all of these and they're asked to recollect as much as they can about the different incidences, saying that, of course, these incidences have been given to them by their relative. So they go to do it. 25% of the people, in whole or in part, recollect the random topic that was placed in that never happened. So you can actually implant an artificial memory which again is, is unsettling. Well, when you consider it's still so very persuasive in our, in our justice system, eyewitness testimony. We'll turn now to discussing this idea of common sense and whether Canadians and players in the, the justice system in general are aware of issues with our memory or memory fallibility and eyewitness testimony. 
do you believe this is common knowledge amongst Canadians and players in of our justice system? Uh, no, it's not. It's interesting because you might remember R versus Macintosh. And R versus Macintosh basically was a situation where the defense wanted to bring in Daniel Yarmy as an expert witness in the fallibility of memory. And the judge in that case said no, because the expert witness wouldn't be able to add anything because the fallibility of memory is common sense. The defense, of course, appealed this, and the Ontario Appellate Court agreed with the judge that it is indeed common sense. So there's a reluctance to bring expert witnesses into trial talking about the fallibility of memory because they feel it would be a waste of time and money and it's common sense. And if anyone was going to uh, refresh the memory, (laughs) notice the pun there, refresh the memory of the jury, it can be done by the players, it can be done by the judge or the prosecutors or the defense attorney. Well, we have just done a meta-analysis of the different players in the justice system. Now, what a meta-analysis is, is taking all of the studies that were done on a particular topic, gathering all the information together and statistically analyzing it globally. So, for example, when I talked about the meta-analysis of body language, right? There have all been a number of studies done on body language and whether or not we can interpret deception and all of that sort of stuff. All of those studies were brought together, a meta-analysis was done, and the conclusion at the time was that we cannot do it. We cannot detect deception through body language. Well, we did a meta-analysis to see whether or not the players of the justice system have a knowledge about the science behind the fallibility of eyewitness testimony. Because if they're going to inform the jury, they need to know, don't they? They can inform the jury. So what did we find? Well, we broke it up into two groups, and these are my two honor students this year, uh, Selena Beckford and Chiara Nanucci. They're the two that can be credited with doing these studies. So basically, the first one, Chiara, was doing defense lawyers, prosecutors, and police officers, basically because those are the people who collect and introduce the evidence in the courtroom right? That's why we separated them out. Basically, defense lawyers, not only in Canada, but the United States, Britain, Netherlands, China, we got a whole bunch, right? For defense lawyers, we had a, an N of 1,761 defense lawyers in this calculation. Prosecutors, 725. You don't get in many prosecutors, you do defense lawyers, right? And it's harder to get two prosecutors because you have to go through the chief prosecutors who have to agree to allow the prosecutors to be involved in the study. Police officers, 1,704. And basically, this was their knowledge about the fallibility of eyewitness testimony. So in most of the cases, they were given a statement and they have to agree or disagree to it. One of the statements For example, in one of the studies that was done by Wise and Safer was, and now you know the answer to this because we've just discussed it, witnesses are more likely to misidentify someone in a culprit absent lineup when it is presented in a simultaneous, i.e. all members of a lineup are presented at the same time, as opposed to a sequential procedure, all members of a lineup are presented one at a time. Do you agree, disagree, or don't know? That's just one of the questions. There's all sorts of questions. There's questions about detecting deception, a whole number of different questions. So how did they do? The defense lawyers on total, on mass, scored 73.95%. Now, if you were going to turn that into a letter grade, it's a B minus, B minus. In my letter grading system, it's a B minus. Now, think of it this way. You have been a lawyer in the past. Think of this. You are being convicted of a crime. Would you want to know you're putting your hands into a person who scored a B minus, right? It's basically what you're doing. And don't forget, it's, it's on most law firms' websites. We leave no stone unturned, right? And I think that's in the ethical guidelines for lawyers as well. We leave no stone unturned. Well, at 73.95%, there are a hell of a lot of stones that haven't been turned. Prosecutors at 725, that was the end. 51.78%, which is a D. 
Not a great grade. Not a great grade. Police officers, 54.68%, also a D. Also not a good grade. Also not a good grade. And that is across countries, right? So it's not just a local thing to Canada, a local thing to the States. It's happening globally. There is a problem here. Now, don't forget, they're saying this is common knowledge. And if you need to inform the juries, then the defense lawyers or prosecutors could do so. But how can they do so? They're not scoring well. Then we went to look at the adjudicators, judges, jurors, and potential jurors. Potential jurors being people who will at one time or another may be asked to be a juror, right? So 18 years of age and older, basically, a common population. So what do we have? Judges. In this, there were 857 judges. 564 jurors, and potential jurors was 1,794. So those are large ends. Are you riveted to know what the... I am. Can I ask one one question about just the non, non-jury sample? Yeah. So that, that's 18 years or older. That's right. Was there any other factors taken into consideration like occupation or anything? No, no, not in this case, because of course, what we wanted was people to be honest and open. So what do we get? Judges. That's the drum roll. (laughs) Judges, 61.62% or a C. Jurors, 47.45 or an F. Potential jurors did better than both jurors and judges at 64.05% or a C. Potential jurors are doing better than jurors and judges. What this seems to indicate is something's happening in the courtroom that is influencing these jurors such that they go from being 64.05 to 47.45, right? Because they were potential jurors. They go into becoming a juror and something's happening within the courtroom that is changing their view, eyewitness testimony. So reading between the lines, would a possible point of confusion then be instructions they're receiving in the the courtroom? Instructions they're receiving. And let's take a situation. If you are a defense lawyer and you're cross-examining a prosecutor's witness, one of the things you're going to attempt to do is you're going to attempt to make the person on the witness stand think twice, hesitate, become slightly confused, less confident. This, of course, to the jury would indicate that the person is not a reliable witness, but just confidence has nothing to do with veracity of a witness's statement. But the whole system is set up that what you want to do is poke holes in the armor of the witness to make them think twice, second guess what they're saying, hesitate, look confused, so the jury will not buy what they're saying. So this meta-analysis then by your honor students, Ian, this is pretty consistent from my understanding of your other articles and research with your previous findings, right? And and, uh, basically it's consistent with all the findings around the world, right? Uh, We just put them into one big pool and compared. Right. And the big, big conclusion is that this research time and time again is showing that the players in the justice system do not have a full understanding about memory fallibility and eyewitness testimony. That's right. And we have hinted and briefly discussed the reluctance of courts to call upon experts to come in and explain this. And this is largely falls to this this concept of, of common common sense and common knowledge. People think that this, this stuff is understood. Why, in your opinion, do you think courts are so reluctant to pay attention to this research and want experts to come in and, and better inform triers of fact, judges, juries, etc.? One of the big problems, I think, is when mistakes are found, they're not found immediately, right? They're found sometimes 15, in William's case, 18 years later. So there's no immediate consequence of your action. So it's, it's, it's something, you know, when you do something and you make a mistake and you're corrected, you learn from that mistake. But if you make the mistake and you're not corrected till 18 years later, it's going to be hard for you to change what you're doing. 
And so I think one of the problems is that it has been working all along for these people. And it isn't till a lot later do we find that there was a mistake in what they did. Yeah, it's interesting to me because it's. I understand that they may not find out much later. I, I get that. But when you look at you know just the DNA exonerations that you talked about earlier, right, in the high percentage of cases where faulty eyewitness testimony was included or a factor, a significant factor, you're still you have all this evidence, you have all this research. Why do you think it's still so difficult for the justice players to to pay attention to it? I think one of the problems we have, uh, by the way, this will be important in the sense that it'll show you that there is either a reluctance or they're not paying attention. You know, we talked about Janet Reno and we talked about the fact that she put together the commission. The commission came out with a series of recommendations that they posted in 1999. Now, the interesting thing is there was big hype behind that. If you think about it, the justice system had in essence, egg on their face. With all of these exonerations coming out in the papers, it's it's sort of embarrassing. The, the system seems to be failing. We've got to correct the system. We've got to put confidence back in the system. So what happens is, of course, Janet Reno says, okay, let's look into this and we're going to make it high profile. We're going to let everybody know and we're going to write this report and we're going to announce this report publicly. And they did, and they had a series of recommendations. But we gotta remember recommendations are just that, recommendations, they're not legally binding. You can either accept or reject the recommendation. Well, what we did when we did the meta-analysis, if we looked at the studies that were done pre the Janet Reno Commission and post the Janet Reno Commission, because after Janet Reno did her commission, all sorts of other commissions in all sorts of other countries have it sort of following suit. We have the same thing in Canada. So we wanted to look at pre and post to see if there has been any change in their knowledge. So what we did was we took defense lawyers, prosecutors, and police officers pre-1999 and post-1999. Pre-1999, they scored 45.809% or an F. post 1999, 62.84% or a C. They definitely went up. So some of this was sticking. And as you said, the police officers are tending more towards using a different type of interrogation technique based on the stuff that has come from the psychological literature. You're talking about a sequential lineup technique that's being used in some places. This sort of is creeping into the system. It's getting there. But 20 years after the Janet Reno report, you would expect better than 62.84%. You'd love better than that, right? You'd like higher than that. With judges, jurors, and potential jurors, pre was 39.99%. Absolutely abysmal, really. Afterwards, 65.73% or a C plus. There is, it's happening, but it's not happening fast enough. And why? Police officers in their training, are not getting this information. Lawyers in their training are not getting this information. What needs to happen is this needs to become an integral part of both the police officer's training and the lawyer's training. And that was going to be a question here for you. You mentioned in your articles about the importance of training and education, and that if we, if the courts continue to be reluctant to rely on experts or to use experts, and we're relying on the players of the justice system to bring forth this information through voir dires or cross examinations, judicial instructions, that's really the key component: is that they have to be properly informed and trained. So, would you like to see this then? incorporated in when you go through law school or for police officers at the police academy, more more training than that. Yeah. And we asked an open-ended question of both the law students and the police officers, and both were very positive that they wanted to learn about this stuff. Of course, a police officer wants to do the job correctly, and they need this sort of information in order to minimize their impact on the person's memory for the event. And they want to take the right person and have them judged in a court of law. You don't want to put the wrong person up. So yes, they would be interested in learning this stuff. Now, one of the things we used to do in the past is we used to argue strongly for allowing the 
expert witnesses in. And we still believe that. And maybe that is an interim measure that needs to be done until such time as the police academies and the law schools start implementing right training up on the fallibility of eyewitness testimony. You need the expert witnesses, but the expert witnesses alone are not the answer. And the reason for that is if you remember back to that question I gave you, you know, the one that was the witnesses are more likely to misidentify a person in the culprit absent lineup, the majority of responses by both police officers and lawyers was, I don't know. Well, if you don't know there's a problem, how can you then bring an expert witness in to talk about the problem if you don't know the problem exists? And that's, you know, that's going to be the problem here. You need the education in order to bring the expert witness in, because if you don't know there's a problem with the lineup used, you're not going to bring the expert in to talk about it. So if I gave you the magic wand and you could incorporate this training and education for lawyers and all the justice system players, police officers, judges, in the meantime, until this wave of new generation came through, do you have uh, any suggestions about should the, the courts be almost obligated in cases involving eyewitness testimony to have someone come in and just give a general seminar to the judge or jury? That's right. If wishes could be horses, right, that's what we would have. Basically, you just, if you have the majority of the evidence is by an eyewitness, then you bring in an expert witness to counsel everybody on eyewitness fallibility. So everybody is singing from the same page of the hymn book, has the same knowledge, then they can go and try the case. So how much of this reluctance, though, is, is do you think is related to uh, disruption almost as we, we need a justice system that is efficient? You know, we have Jordan and requirements now for timelines of getting things tried and finished and concluded. Is there, do you, do you think that plays into the, the reluctance to continue to invite experts into the court system? Yeah, I can understand it because... You know, there are the time constraints. There's the money component to this too, right? We're, we're talking about if wishes could be horses. That's not the case. Uh, we, we understand that there's time constraints and there's, you know, that uh, there is a docket that needs to be gone through. And there's a lot of cases that are backlogged and to bring an expert witness in every time is going to be uh, very difficult to coordinate. Yeah, I understand that. But one of the things we have to realize is that we want the right person, right, to be found guilty of the crime. And there's, there's a trade-off there, isn't there? And it's a difficult one. That's the most important thing, though, that we're, we're convicting the people that are actually guilty and, and we're getting the right, right people. But Ian, I'm getting mindful of your time now. It's been a great conversation. Your insights were really, really awesome to have. Is there, do you have social media or anywhere people can go to follow your work or keep up to date with research you're doing? It's the uh, research gate is basically, if you go on to research gate, you'll be able to see all of our stuff there. Okay, great. And they just have to search your name, I think is. That's right. You search my name. And if you want anything, just let me know on research gate. Sometimes there are uh, publication restrictions but we have private copies. So if you want a copy, you just let me know and we can slip you one privately. Okay, sounds good. Well, in the show notes, I'll, I'll put the links to uh, your info and, and the titles of the articles that I used in preparing for our conversation and also a link to your research gate profile for people that are interested in, in looking at more of your research and work. Again, thank you very much for coming on today. It was, it was a great chat. Thank you very much for having me.